Dear colleagues, welcome to today's EICVI webinar on role of contrast echocardiography in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. I'm Dr. Andreas Helfen from St. Marien Hospital Lünn, and I have the pleasure of being joined today by Professor Roxy Senior from Royal Brompton Hospital and Professor Bernard Cousin from Universitaire Siekenhuis, Brussel. The aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of the role of contrast echocardiography in patients with COVID-19 through clinical case presentation. The session is interactive and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. For best learning experience, we also invite you to participate in online assessment sessions in the form of multiple choice questions that will be submitted during the presentations. This program is supported by Braco in form of an educational grant. I will now hand over to Professor Cousin for the first presentation, please. Thank you uh, very, very much indeed, Andreas. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with all of you uh, and also to be uh, able to present this. Uh, just to um, uh, mention that I have no disclosure regarding this uh, particular presentation. And so um, as an introduction, of course, you probably all known that um, COVID infection is a multi-systemic disease. And uh, of course, there is also some involvement of the heart in this infection that can lead to three great types of myocardial disease, myocardial infarction, heart failure, and also an, uh, a risk of arrhythmias that is increased due to various uh, mechanisms. Saying that, so uh, in order to guide a little bit the clinicians, uh, we have provided some recommendations regarding the role of cardiac imaging in terms of precautions, indications, but also in terms of protection for the patients, but also for healthcare personnel. And a uh, very short summary. So uh, when you have a patient with a COVID infection, of course, and you consider cardiac imaging, you have to carefully uh, consider the uh, indication because of the risk of infection for the personnel. And therefore, if you have a patient which is uh, COVID positive or uh, if highly suspect of COVID uh, and you have to proceed to cardiac imaging, you have, of course, to apply a different, um, different matters of precautions and to follow, of course, the, the, the rules from your own hospital. Just to mention that if you intend to proceed to some uh, other um, imaging uh, modalities like transophageal echo, you can increase the uh, risk of airborne uh, uh, dissemination and therefore you have to take some additional precautions. Saying that, uh, echo has a very important role to play in the global evaluation of the patients with COVID-19. And the survey that we recently conducted uh, under the, the leading of Mark Dweck uh, as showing in this uh, alluvial plot that when echo is performed, in 50% of the cases, the echo will be abnormal. And uh, among these patients with abnormal echo, in 30% of the cases, in one third of the patients, this has changed the management of the patient. So therefore, there is certainly an important role in echocardiography to uh, uh, manage your patients with COVID infection. Saying that, I'm moving now to the uh, first case. It's a case of a 63 years old man from African origin. He has no cardiovascular risk factors except hypertension. He was hospitalized with a severe COVID pneumonia, which was confirmed by PCR. And uh, actually this patient was critically ill and complaining of pain in the left leg. He had no chest pain. And we made the diagnostic of lower limb acute ischemia. Therefore the patient underwent a Fogarty demonstrating a fresh thrombus. However, the patient was also presenting with uh, an increase in the troponins and an abnormal ECG compatible with a non-STEMI anterior. And this, uh, brings me to the first MCQ, uh, 
so we will be able to vote. So please find the what are the right answers among my proposals. You can already begin to vote now. So the first next step should be transthoracic echo. It could be coronary artery angiography with ventriculography, transesophageal echocardiography, CT angiography, cardiac magnetic resonance with perfusion. Please vote. So I remember that these patients from African origin as uh, one risk factors, which is uh, hypertension. Yes, a slightly elevated troponin uh, with an abnormal ECG, but at no chest pain. And he had also, of course, an embolic event. So I don't know, Andreas, if we have already some uh, answers from the audience. Uh, we have a few seconds. Uh, so maybe I can ask you a question. Um, what was um, the most frequent indication for performing an echo in COVID-19 patients in the survey you mentioned uh, in your slide? Yo, uh, that's a very good, uh, a very good point. So uh, the main indication was um, the suspicion of myocardial injury. So in patients with an increase of troponin, which is quite frequent in this population, as you may know. Uh, the second most frequent indication was the suspicion of left ventricular dysfunction and heart failure. And the third one was uh, the presence of uh, pulmonary hypertension and the evaluation of the right ventricular function. That was the three main indications in this survey. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have uh, the answers of our audience. Um, the majority, 79% voted for transthoracic echocardiography. But there have been a few votes for coronary angiography, 6% and 7% for CT angiography, 3% for CMR with perfusion and 5% for transesophageal echocardiography. So what is your answer? So in fact, almost all proposals were uh, most, most of, yeah, more or less correct, except probably transesophageal echo. Uh, and uh, as you may know, because we, we uh, were faced with this, this problematic of myocardial injury and uh, uh, a lot of demand uh, regarding echocardiography in this setting, uh, we have produced a, a document, a position paper, uh, in order to give some, to provide some guidance. And I will refer to one of the table that was adapted from uh, the guidelines on uh, chronic coronary syndromes. Uh, where, in fact, you have to look at the symptoms and the characteristic of the ECG. Here, we have no symptoms suggested, but the ECG is suggestive. We know that the patient has an increase in troponin. We know that he has also hypertension. He's middle-aged or a little bit older than middle-aged. He's a male. Um, therefore, we are now, if we look at the panel, in, in a patients with a high clinical likelihood or a pre uh, Pre uh, test probability, and therefore all the proposals having or a CCTA or a CMR perfusion or an echocardiography are correct. Uh, and uh, well, since the suspicion of the uh, of, of indeed some myocardial injury is very high, in fact, invasive angiography with the ventriculography is not a bad answer. But transesophageal echo is certainly not the next step to proceed. And this is the results of the uh, transthoracic echo that we get in this patient. So I let you carefully look at these, but um, as you can see, first the patient is tachycard. You can see that the heart rate is around 120 and the quality of the image is quite poor. You can have some doubt about the epicolateral region. There are also some kind of potential hyperdensity there but it's very difficult to draw any conclusion from this examination. And therefore, we have been moving on to coronary angiography. And as you can see here on this slide, uh, there is clearly an obstruction of the LAD, LAD uh, with the presence of a very important thrombus there. And so we have proceeded to an, an aspiration of the thrombus, and it was quite interesting to note that there was no epicardial lesions uh, that were present. So it was really compatible with an embolic event. 
And this brings me to the second questions, uh, questions. So you can also uh, vote for these questions. In this particular uh, questionnaire, uh, there is uh, one wrong answer. And so my questions are the following. Uh, contrast the cocardiography. One should have been performed initially. Second, maybe dangerous and is contraindicated. Third, may be used to improve the endocardial border delineation and better assess the wall motion abnormalities. Four, to detect microvascular disease, it could be also useful. And, and finally, uh, contrast echo may require additional protection. So uh, I remember you that in this patient, the quality of the transthoracic echo was far from optimal. Uh, this patient is critically ill, uh, so he was requiring some uh, oxygen support, uh, non-invasively, but uh, still. And uh, of course, uh, this patient had uh, so normal epicardial arteries after the aspiration of the thrombus. I don't know if you have already some answer, uh, Andreas. Oh, we have uh, uh, only a few seconds. I think we have the answers now, yes. Um, uh, the majority uh, of our audience um, prefers answer B, uh, may be dangerous and is contraindicated. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a very good answer. Uh, and of course, uh, maybe you can remember some <laughs> the black box warning that was uh, raised uh, about the contrast agents for ultrasound in 2007 and 2008, respectively. Uh, but uh, as you may know, there were some uh, uh, studies, and I'm pretty sure that Roxy will allude on that more in detail. But um, after these studies, these, there, there was a, a removing of this black box warning regarding contrast echo in, in these patients. Indeed, the risk of, um, of adverse events in this population is very low. And if you compare, for example, the risk with other diagnostic procedures like transphageal echo, it's much more lower than transphageal echo. It's also much more lower than coronary angiography. And so we have uh, shown that critically ill patients will have lower risk of mortality, a 24% decrease if you use contrast agents in these critically ill patients. And it's probably related to the risk of missing an important diagnosis if you are not using the contrast echo. For example, free wall rupture and pseudo aneurysm, but also apical thrombus. And indeed, we have proceed in these patients to contrast injection and you can clearly see at the epical, in the epical region that there was also a thrombus there. So corresponding to the zone where there was also uh, an obstruction due to the thrombus uh, in the LAD. So for sure contrast echo was very helpful in order to improve the tissue characterization. Now um, in these patients, we can also discuss about the role of uh, microcirculation assessment using contrast and the flash replenishment principle. And Roxy will allude a little bit more uh, in details later on on that. So I will not uh, give too much details on that, but this should be also a potentially interesting indication since we know that we have much more minoca in the COVID-19 population that we have in the global population. And just regarding protection, of course, we cannot say that uh, contrast echo is not requiring more uh, protection measures uh, because, um, in fact, you need to have someone to help you to inject the contrast agent. That's for one. So meaning that you expose more people to uh, the, the disease. Uh, and in this particular patient, what is really interesting is that in fact, he was critically healed, so having already um, an intravenous line, so not prolonging uh, too much the time of the procedure, which should be shortened as much as possible. But interestingly, I think if you compare that to the risk conveyed by transphageal echo and the benefit that you can expect from contrast uh, echo in comparison with transphageal echo, you can clearly see that uh, you have the same benefit 
confidence regarding the wall motion interpretation using contrast echo compared to transfragile echo, and the same uh, confidence in the evaluation of ejection fraction in, 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 with the both procedures in the, in the same patients. Therefore, if you know that using transophageal echo, which is a higher risk uh, procedure and it requires much more precaution than contrast echo, it makes sense to use contrast echo uh, and first intention. So my take home messages are that contrast echo is actually not routinely recommended in all COVID-19 patients and of course requires specific protection measures. Nevertheless, contrast echo is a valuable tool mainly to improve in the cardial border delineation and uh, for the thrombus detection. In acutely ill patients, contrast echo has been shown to be safe and to save lives. And uh, as you may know, we are actually conducting also a survey regarding the use of contrast echo in the COVID hospitalized patient. It's a, it's a joint venture with the American Society of Echo and Roxy is actually chairing this uh, survey. And uh, so we will come back uh, very soon with uh, some data on the safety and the efficiency of this contrast echo in this particular population. I thank you for your attention. <clears throat> thank you very much, Benna, for this uh, uh, very good uh, presentation. Um, I think um, we discuss uh, your presentation at the end of the webinar and uh, um, we have uh, now plenty of questions uh, and um, uh, I had, will hand over to Professor Senior for the next presentation and we finish then with a discussion. Please, Roxy. Thank you very much, Andreas. So I will pick up uh, from where Professor Kozan has left this. So these are my disclosures. So first of all, I'll take you through uh, uh, a contrast echo in the acute care setting. So transtrastic echo, of course, should be performed when indicated. But we know that in acute care setting, uh, because of the unique situation, the image quality can be markedly compromised because of patient immobility, high body mass index, inflated lungs due to mechanical ventilation, et cetera. So the question is, does contrast echo actually help in acute care setting and is it safe? So I'll take you through some data regarding this first. So this is looking at uh, the impact of contrast echo on clinical management of patients. And this is a large prospective study over 600 patients being conducted 10 years ago uh, in US. And what we see here is, uh, so this slide looks at the impact of contrast on patient management uh, related to, so this blue bar showing procedure avoided only, medication change only, or both medication and procedural change. So if you look at the bar charts here, so let's concentrate on the acute care setting. So we're looking at medical intensive care unit and surgical intensive care unit. And you can see here that in medical intensive care unit, uh, the changes that were brought about uh, following contrast uh, uh, injection is about in the region of 35%. And in the surgical intensive care unit, it's about 60%. So quite a you know, high percentage of patients actually benefited from contrast echocardiography in this uh, prospective analysis. So if we now move on to see whether contrast echo is actually safe in this population. So this is looking at acute mortality in hospitalized patients in a registry in US, which included over 4 million patients, consecutive patients of which 58,000 had undergone contrast enhanced studies. And you can see that in the uh, contrast echo group, patients did die within one day of administration of contrast in about 1.06%, but patients without contrast also died. So not giving contrast, just an echocardiogram, these patients did have mortality. Now, if we look at the difference between the two group after multivariable, logis multivariable logistic regression analysis, taking into account all the other risk factors, contrast echo actually resulted in 24% uh, less likelihood of dying uh, 
within one day than patient not receiving contrast. And this is, as was alluded by Bernard before, that this is mainly because, as also seen in the previous study, contrast echo actually improved the management of the patient by arriving at correct diagnosis versus those patients who did not undergo contrast echocardiography. And that resulted in improvement in outcome. And this is further elucidated four years later in another study, again in critically ill patients looking at acute mortality. It, this is a propensity matched population where the baseline characteristics of these two groups of patients who were admitted in the critical care unit were matched first. And then they looked at mortality and you can see the mortality, this is uh, mortality in hospitalized patients. So this is maybe three to four days. It's quite, you know, it's 14% in non-contrast group and about 13.5% in the contrast group. Uh, but if you look at the mortality within 48 hours, there is again a 28% lower mortality in patients who received uh, contrast, again alluding to the fact that these patients may have had a more appropriate diagnosis uh, compared to those who did not um, get contrast and therefore they benefited more. So these two studies show that contrast echo not only is safe, but may actually improve mortality uh, in acute uh, uh, care patients. So on the basis of these studies, um, uh, the recent recommendation, which was published in 2017, recommended that contrast echo should be used when two or more contiguous left ventricular segments are not clearly visualized and it should also be used where apical structural abnormality is suspected or any structural abnormality is suspected, particularly looking at LV thrombus. And this is particularly relevant in this COVID population who have, had, who have a high incidence of thromboembolic phenomena, that one should use contrast to be sure that the patient doesn't have a thrombus. And also perfusion should be performed to characterize cardiac masses because you may have a mass which could be you know, a tumor, not a thrombus. So uh, if there is no vascularity in that mass with, uh, 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 and no perfusion in that mass, this is likely to be a thrombus and under the circumstances of high um, a thrombogenicity in this population. And therefore, uh, a treatment can be applied appropriately. And one can also assess perfusion to look at microcirculation, as has been alluded by Bernard in, in, uh, uh, previously, and also to distinguish uh, uh, ischemic versus non-ischemic uh, uh, cardiac dysfunction. So I'm going to now show you a series of four patients from our cohort of uh, hospitalized patients with COVID. And this first uh, patient uh, will involve uh, for uh, uh, you know multiple choice questions. So pay a lot of attention to what I'm going to say now. So, so this is a patient, typical patient with COVID-19 pneumonia admitted in ITU, mechanically ventilated, 70 year old, 76 year old female, uh, hemodynamically unstable with recurrent arrhythmias and with all the cardiovascular risk factors, you know, hypertension, dyslipidemia, et cetera. And this patient had three times raised troponin and anti-pro BNP and very high levels of D-dimer. So the echo requested was to assess whether the patient has got wall motion abnormality, meaning does this patient have ischemic heart disease and what is the LV function because the patient is hemodynamically unstable. So the echo was performed and, you know, this is a typical echo in ITU setting and we couldn't get images better than this. So my question to all of you here is, have a look at this echo and then answer these questions. So one is an appropriate answer. So the first um, uh, question is, whether the LV is normal, meaning normal LVF with no resting wall motion abnormality. The second is the patient has a normal LV ejection fraction, but there is wall motion abnormality, or is it that only the ejection fraction is reduced, or is it that both the ejection fraction uh, is reduced and there's regional wall motion abnormality? And lastly, I don't know. So please go ahead and select. <laughs> 
So uh, while our audience is um, voting, Roxy, um, there are a few questions coming in um, about uh, the technique of contrast echocardiography in this setting. Uh, about uh, if do you use a bolus or an infusion or uh, what? Uh, how many contrast do you use? How many, many milliliters? Have you a special setup? Uh, what is your mechanical index? Uh, please um, okay. give us an idea. <laughs> All right, yeah, quite a lot of questions, but yeah, I can answer it in two lines. Uh, we always use low MI contrast specific imaging setting because with that, you can assess both the uh, wall motion, wall thickening, and also perfusion simultaneously. So in one setting, you can get everything. Now, in this scenario, we tend to give bolus injection, slow bolus injection, and which can look at both LV wall motion and perfusion simultaneously by doing that. So yes, so low MI imaging, bolus injection, uh, which will also require less contrast. In contrast-specific setting, you use less contrast. So, you know, it's a perfect uh, setting to use. Okay, thank you. Um, we have now the answers. And um, the majority of uh, our audience uh, voted for, I don't know, 39%. And um, normal ejection with regional wall motion abnormality was the second uh, most answer given with 21%, followed by low ejection fraction with regional wall, mo uh, wall motion abnormalities, again, 21%. And only 11% of uh, our audience voted for normal ejection fraction without any regional wall motion abnormality. So what is your answer? Well, that perfectly highlights why contrast echo should be used. So here you are. <laughs> so we injected contrast. And, you know, I fully agree with many of the answers that you've given because we also were in the same dilemma. We were, somebody was saying there's wall motion abnormality. Another person was saying, oh, there's low ejection fraction. And nobody was saying that it was normal, right? So this clearly shows, now, first of all, what you see with this bolus injection is that, you know, the, uh, the image quality is vastly improved, right? And also what you see here is you can see the endocardium and the epicardium very clearly, and therefore you can assess wall thickening very clearly. So now you can easily say that the wall thickening is normal, the ejection fraction is normal. Now before this, the intensivist was looking at us and saying, come on, tell us what, what's wrong, is, is the LV okay? And we couldn't say. So as soon as we injected contrast, even the intensivist never asked us whether it's normal or not because he saw it was normal and he walked away. So, so that's the great thing about using contrast. So, uh, so moving on, so this is another patient, um, typical patient, 71-year-old male uh, with all the cardiovascular risk factors with previous history of heart failure. Again, you know, typical scenario of raised troponin, but markedly raised BNP actually, and raised D-dimer. So here the request also was to assess cardiac function. And so we did transthoracic echo. As we said, we always start off with a transthoracic echo. We don't give contrast straight away. We look at the images and then decide. Now here, the transthoracic echo looks pretty good, meaning the images are good, but the heart is not good. You can see the LV is, uh, you know, is dilated, severely globally hypokinetic. The RV is dilated and severely globally hypokinetic. So it's a biventricular dysfunction. But what we were worried about is at the apex, you can see there looks like to be something there quite a thick uh, apex there. So because of high thrombogenicity in this population, we need to know whether the patient has a thrombus at the top. So uh, we injected contrast here. And you can see with contrast, it's quite clear that the apex, you know, what the thick apex that you saw is no longer thick. You can see the myocardium clearly. And what you see here is a lot of trabeculation and that may have conglom conglomerated to give you an appearance of a mass. So again, it's a very useful test where we told the in intensivists that no, you don't need to give any anticoagulation, at least not for thrombus. And they were very happy with that. So let's move on to another patient now. Now this patient has a markedly dilated RV and severe RV dysfunction. And when we further imaged this patient uh, without using contrast, we saw a mass here. <laughs> 
So again, the question is whether it's a thrombus. Now, as I've said before, in order for you to assess this mass properly, you not only need to delineate the mass, but also you need to characterize the mass. And as, as I've discussed before, this is the principle of using contrast echo, not only in COVID setting, but actually in, in other settings also, that you don't use high mechanical index because you destroy contrast. You may use LVO setting, which all of you know is an intermediate MI setting, but here also, you see that you destroy a little bit of contrast. You see the LVO pacification, but you don't see perfusion at all. And you end up injecting a bit more contrast to see the LVO pacification a bit better because the contrast is getting destroyed. But in the low MI uh, setting, as you can see here, uh, uh, which is a contrast specific setting, the tissue cancellation is better. And because the tissue cancellation is better, the signal to noise ratio of contrast is much better. There's a more uniform opacification of LV from apex right up to the base. And the amount of contrast that you use is much less than in the other settings. And you can uh, you know, assess perfusion, and therefore you can assess also any um, um, uh, mass uh, in terms of whether it is perfused or not. So in this particular case, we injected contrast and this is looking at RV. And what you see here is linear structure. It's a linear structure, you're not a rounded structure. So it's not a mass. And you can see some contrast in between. And this is really trabeculae, which you see so often in the right ventricle, and especially when it is dilated. So it's a trabecular structure. And we assured the, uh, uh, our intensive is that the patient doesn't have a thrombus. So then this is another patient, again, RV dysfunction, and here again we see a mass, and we injected contrast in the same low MI contrast specific in imaging, and you can see now that this mass doesn't have any contrast uptake, and there's a lot of contrast outside, and we called it a thrombus, and this patient was then uh, managed appropriately with antithrombotic therapy. So now, we come to another scenario, and now these are patients not from our, uh, from the COVID uh, you know population, uh, but from other uh, you know acute population that we had. So these are two patients, both showing regional wall motion abnormality. Now, as you know, in COVID patients, ischemic heart disease incidence is high. They have a thromboembolic phenomena, as um, uh, Bernard has shown very nicely, uh, thrombus in the uh, LED. So these patients may present with, you know, wall motion abnormality, regional wall motion abnormality. Now, if you have, so in, in order to distinguish whether this is due to myocarditis, because remember in COVID patients, it could well be because of myocarditis, you can have regional wall motion abnormality, or it can be due to, you know, um, um, a Tucker Subo type of syndrome because of high catecholamine secretion, you can induce wall motion abnormality. But the question here really is whether this patient should go to the cath lab straight away or can you wait? So in order to do that, we need to look at perfusion. So if in, you know in coronary artery disease, in ischemic heart disease, the perfusion will be reduced. But if it's not coronary artery disease, it won't be reduced. But the important thing is to see whether it is reduced or not. So if you look at the first, this patient here, so corresponding perfusion imaging, low MI, contrast specific setting, uh, and you can see here, flash, it becomes black, the myocardium, and then it fills up very quickly. So this is a completely normal perfusion in a markedly abnormal left ventricle. So this patient, you do not need to send the patient to a cat lab because the patient is safe for the time being. But in the other patient, you can see there's wall motion abnormality on the left, and this is a perfusion study again. And now you can see after injection, that the apex is markedly hypo, sorry, hypo perfused uh, with um, perfusion present in the basis. Now this patient has come in acutely with wall motion abnormality. Now this patient is a candidate that should go off and get an angiogram done. So in conclusion, uh, unenhanced transthoracic echo is the first investigation when indicated. You don't start off with contrast echo, but give contrast because it has the potential to change management strategies in patients with non-diagnostic transthoracic echo and in the evaluation of cardiac masses. And it also helps to distinguish ischemic versus non-ischemic LV dysfunction. So as uh, Bernard has said, 
that we, we are running a survey and I'll be very happy for you to participate in that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Roxy, for your excellent presentation. Um, I think we proceed now with a uh, discussion and uh, we have a few uh, questions um, for Roxy. Um, uh, do you use a special contrast agent or uh, does it, uh, is it important? Are there differences between uh, contrast agents or can you use every available contrast agent? Uh, I mean uh, left heart uh, contrast agents. That means uh, bubbles that pass the lung. Yeah, so, so as you all are aware, there are three contrast agents today available in the market, especially uh, particularly in the Western world, uh, that is uh, um, uh, Definity or Luminity, Sonoview, or uh, in, in US it's called Lumify, and um, sorry, Lumazon. See, it's, it's, these names are very you know, close to each other. Lumify is actually a Philips <laughs> uh, portable machine. So Lumazon in, um, in US, and then we've got Optison. So you can use any of these three agents and uh, there's no uh, real difference between these three agents as far as uh, efficacy and safety is concerned. Uh, then um, I have a question for Bernard um, and this is about um, the use of global longitudinal strain in COVID-19 patients. What do you think? Is it worth to use uh, such a method or um, is the image quality so demanding that it is probably not very helpful? What is your experience? So of course, it's a little bit far from a contrast uh, echo, <laughs> but uh, I can answer to that indeed. Yeah. So as you may know in the recommendations um, uh, regarding the precautions and the indications of FACO, we also mentioned that we have to avoid during the pandemic uh, to use electrocardiogram electrodes put on the patients to avoid any risk of contamination. Therefore, it's very difficult to, of course, to analyze the strain imaging without electrocardiogram, as you may know, that's for first. And second, I think what you said is relevant. So uh, the quality of imaging is often insufficient to, uh, to uh, draw any, any strong conclusions using this uh, this method. I know there are some publications proposing it, uh, especially from China, but actually uh, since it was not recommended, uh, I'm not sure that it's uh, feasible to proceed to a strain uh, analysis on basis on, on the, the, the imaging in most of the patients with COVID, since most of them had uh, uh, indeed some, some uh, pulmonary problems and uh, of course were difficult to image. So I should rather favor contrast echo than strain in, in this particular setting. If I may add something about I think the settings regarding contrast echo, an important point mentioned by Roxy is that we use a very small amount of contrast and we use a low myocardial index and I think this is also very important to apply in terms of safety because we, we both mentioned that safety is an important issue and concerns from clinicians but so the lower the MI the lower the dose of contrast uh, I think the lower is the, the potential toxicity and, and side effects so this is my, maybe something that should be also be mentioned. Yes, uh, I agree uh, completely. Um, there is um, um, another question uh, about um, a patient with uh, nephropathy, so uh, impaired renal function. Um, do we have to consider uh, renal function when we use contrast um, or um, uh, can we use it nevertheless how the renal function is? What do you uh, think, Dana? Well, I, I don't think there is any restriction related to, uh, uh, to, to, to for, for contrast agent related to the, uh, the, the renal disease or the, the, this decrease in uh, uh, creatinine clearance, for example. Uh, 
So actually, uh, we, we don't take this into account in, in, in all of the patients. Indeed, I think it's an important question since we also know that there are a lot of acute kidney injury in these patients, but this was not considered uh, in, in, in our patients as a contraindication. Uh, can I uh, chip in, uh, Andreas? Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think, I, I mean, what Bernard says is absolutely right. So, but what I'm saying is that uh, there is a misconception, isn't it? Because we use the word contrast. Uh, it, it's our fault, really, because we use the word <laughs> contrast and immediately they think that contrast is like, you know, uh, Korean geography, uh, radiographic contrast. Now, the Americans have actually changed this and they, they, they call it echo-enhancing agent. They've changed from contrast to echo-enhancing agent exactly for this reason, because it conveys the wrong information uh, to the pe people and, uh, uh, because they always think in terms of radiological contrast. So yes, so this is a micro bubble which doesn't affect renal function at all. It is exhaled and it is broken down in the liver. The, uh, the, uh, the shell is broken down in the liver and the gas is exhaled. So it has nothing to do with uh, the kidney function. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, there is um, another question for Roxy. Um, um, the, the bubbles contain gas and the gas, uh, you mentioned it, uh, is exhaled. Um, uh, in patients with uh, COVID-19 pneumonia, uh, do we have to consider uh, this? Is there um, a reduced uh, exhalation of the the gas, uh, is this of any concern for you? Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, it's a good question, but uh, we haven't, so, so we've, you know, given a contrast in quite a few patients in our population. We've, uh, in about, you know, uh, uh, 25 patients, we've given uh, a contrast. And in none of the patients, we had any issue with contrast. So I'm not sure that it's, go uh, you know, that it will have any significant effect. But I think that's the reason why we need to, uh, you know, still collect data in uh, patients undergoing contrast to actually look at, uh, you know, uh, the consequences of giving contrast. Uh, but, you know, the studies that I've quoted in acute care setting where many of them have got uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, you know, large number of patients have that uh, besides COVID, uh, nothing of that sort was observed. Yes, and um, then I have uh, a question about uh, positive pressure uh, airway ventilation. Um, does this influence the image quality of contrast echocardiography if we use high PEEP values? What is your experience? Yeah, so we've given a contrast in these patients. So, the, you know, many of our patients were ventilated and we've given contrast and it didn't seem to have a major impact on the arrival of contrast on the left side of the heart. Okay. Um, there are a few questions about uh, the uh, venous assess. Um, maybe for Bernard, is um, makes it a difference. Um, can we use uh, central venous lines, peripheral lines? Uh, what is your uh, experience? Yeah, I think indeed uh, many of the patients at uh, central lines and uh, we have uh, used this, um, this as uh, uh, the, the best way probably to inject the contrast, but it makes no difference in terms of quality uh, com compared to, to, uh, to uh, peripheral lines. So I, I think it doesn't really matter. So I think both are giving good results. Uh, so because, you know, these, um, all the bubbles, there are a lot of bubbles that are passing through the pulmonary filter and then entering uh, through the capillaries into the, the left ventricular circulation. And so it's such a huge amount of bubbles that it doesn't make any difference. So whatever the, the line you use, it will be okay. You will have a good quality of imaging. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, I have a question about the use of handheld echocardiography uh, devices and um, uh, contrast. I think, what is your opinion? It's not possible, right? 
Well, I, I don't think yeah, uh, we have um, uh, features for contrast imaging it with, uh, with handheld echo. I don't think it is available. Uh, so as we've said, you know, with contrast echo, we need uh, a low mechanical index or even intermediate LVO setting. It should be harmonic at that point. I don't think those machines yet have that facility. Yeah, I can only agree about it. Um, then um, I have a question about um, the use of uh, Vino Venus uh, ECMO. This is sometimes used in patients with uh, severe uh, COVID-19 pneumonia and uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome. Um, are there any concerns? What is about um, a gas alarm? Does a pump work if we inject contrast? Um, maybe Roxy and then Bernard, what do you think? I don't think we have given contrast in, you know, ECMO patients yet. Maybe I will have in the future. <laughs> There is <laughs> but actually... I but I don't know. They haven't raised any issue that we shouldn't be given. I yeah. don't think they've uh, come back I, and said, don't give it. I ask uh, Roxy because uh, um, I think two months ago there was an, a letter to the editor for the Journal of American Society of ECHO from uh, the Royal Prompton Hospital from intensive care uh, doctors uh, who actually given that in I think 10 patients. So uh, I ask you if you have uh, experience, what is uh, Bernard, what is your opinion about it? Well, I have no personal experience, but I've seen this paper from a uh, group of Susanna. Uh -huh. And indeed, uh, so they seem to, to have some, some indications there, but we have no personal experience uh, in, in this particular patient. So um, I think uh, when the pump stops, uh, this may be very dangerous for the patient if uh, they are prone to very low oxygen uh, content and maybe uh, cardiac arrest happens. So this may be very dangerous if you are not uh, um, in a very experienced uh, staff working uh, who can deal with this kind of problems. Okay, so... Um, This will be a question for future studies, maybe uh, change uh, some um, alarms in the ECMO pumps for contrast. Um, let's go back to um, a few questions from uh, the audience. Um, um, uh, I have to look here. Um, what is really interesting, there are a few questions about how to properly perform uh, contrast. Uh, uh, you mentioned, Bernard, um, that um, help is needed and additional protection. Uh, so how do you perform it? Um, you have a nurse when you give contrast on the yes, ICU? Assistant, yes, using because you have to be concentrated on, on, on the images and to get the right images at the right time, especially if you use the flash replenishment principle. I think you still have to have some hands uh, free to, to click on, on, on the screen in order to, to start the, the sequence. So you will need to have someone helping you to inject the contrast and to take the images. But honestly, it can be done uh, alone, but it's much more complex because then you have to inject and then you have to go back to take your to take your uh, your images and then you have to to to, to put on the on the screen to to, to start a flash replenishment uh, sequences so i think it's much more easier to to go for it uh, being two but this means also that uh, the other the other one should be also equipped and protected so that's what i mean by additional protection Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so in our, uh, the way we, did, we are doing it now is uh, that, uh, uh, so the echocardiographer is performing the echo, and if he needs to give contrast, uh, Bernard is quite right, he can give it himself and get the images, but if he wants to do more complex, you know, uh, assessment, then the nurse, there's always a nurse, you know, in the, in the ITU or in the acute setting, in the HDU, etc., Uh, instructed to give the uh, a contrast slowly. So it's always a slow injection, a bolus injection, and then that particular person gets the uh, images. So uh, 
in a way, uh, we don't have additional person in the room, except, you know, wh whoever's available in that area, we take help of that. Okay. Um, then uh, perhaps, Roxy, um, you can answer uh, a question about experience when we um, use uh, myocardial contrast imaging for Minoka or for uh, perfusion. You have shown uh, your examples with the LED uh, perfusion defect. Um, what is your experience? How well works it on an intensive care unit with a COVID patient? Do you have uh, appropriate echo machines? Um, do you have staff uh, around the clock who is able to perform such a study? How do you uh, structure these uh, kind of examinations? Yeah, so uh, as I've said, you know, you, you give a bolus, right? Small boluses, the setting is the same. It's low MI contrast specific image. The setting is exactly the same, and you are injecting the contrast and acquiring the sequence and flashing. So uh, there's not a huge amount of difference, except that the image quality should be reasonable to you know to get all those images. Uh, but once you give contrast, as you've seen, you know you, it really becomes a great image to to look at everything. So so yes, it is very much feasible to do. In fact, we have looked at. Uh, uh, patients with COVID uh, with perfusion. And in fact, there was an example that we have uh, with severe LV dysfunction. Again, the question was whether it is ischemic or not. And we looked at areas where, you know, where there's severe wall motion abnormality and that had completely normal perfusion. So it was unlikely that it was ischemic. So yes, it can be done. Yeah, uh, my point was, um, um, you are working in a very uh, professional and highly uh, educated uh, area, but um, I think in lots of hospitals around Europe, um, it is difficult to perform on the ICU perfusion images. Uh, and this was uh, my point. Um, how, yeah. what do you think, um, what is needed to be, um, to be able to perform on an ICU a perfusion imaging? Uh, is it uh, possible that an uh, intensive care uh, physician is able to, to be trained to learn this? What do you think? So yeah, you need trained personnel, there's no question. You know, any technique, uh, you know, whether it's echo, MRI, spec, there needs to be trained person doing it, and especially perfusion. Uh, so, so the way we we are doing it uh, at the Brompton and uh, you know and in Norfolk Park Hospital also, it's our team which goes there and does the uh, um, you know assessment. Uh, so, uh, so we our trained sonographers go there and uh, acquire the images and they give contrast and they take and they also we have fellows going there. So, mm -hmm. for example, if they have to do this complex perfusion. We have fellows on standby who come along and do it. So your question whether the intensivists can be trained to do it, anybody can be trained to do it, but then they should be trained to do echocardiography, number one, right? <laughs> they should be trained to do um, you know, on a daily basis, and they should be trained to understand you know, the technique of contrast. So they need proper training. Let's <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Maybe the last question is um, again about safety. Uh, there is a question about uh, allergic reactions and is there, are there special contraindications like pulmonary hypertension? Maybe Bernard, what do you think? Yeah, usually the, uh, the, uh, indeed the allergic reaction are related to the, C, the, the complement activation and it's a pseudo-allergy-like syndrome that we, we call the CARPA syndrome. Um, indeed, it's much more influenced by, by in fact, the, the size of the bubbles, by the, 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 the lipid including the shell, uh, by the presence of uh, non-ionic polymer at the surface, like polaxamer or pegylates. Um, and uh, you don't need to have, uh, of course, a presensitivation. Uh, you can have an allergy uh, the first time you inject the product. Uh, 
So uh, that was the main concern, I think, uh, when uh, there was a black box warning several years ago. But this, this kind of uh, pseudo-allergy-like syndrome is occurring quite rarely first. The only precaution I would suggest is to be prepared to treat it. So it means that in the environment of uh, intensive, intensive care unit, I think there, this is not a real issue. But of course, you have to be trained to identify that it, it's occurring and to be ready to, to treat it. So having epinephrine uh, beta 2 agonist if the patient is not intubated, to have antihistaminic drugs, and of course to have uh, methylprednisone, which is uh, actually uh, much more prescribed than uh, during the first <laughs> week of pandemic. Uh, uh, as you may know, uh, in, in almost all uh, critically ill patients at uh, the intensive care unit. Okay, uh, last question to Roxy. Uh, what are side effects of contrast echo do you see in your clinical practice? Are there any? What do you think? Well, the, uh, the, uh, the major side effects that you see, I mean, the, I won't say major, the common side effects, but even though I say it's common, it's really very, very uncommon. So you see sometimes a light rash appearing in the patient and with uh, with the definity you do see you do, uh, patients do get back pain which is one of the uh, you know uh, 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 side effects that is quite unique to uh, definity because of the shell that it has uh, but those are very few and far and we are really not worried about it but as Bernard has said you know you do get this occasional severe reaction for which everyone should be prepared to deal with. It is very uncommon, you know, one in 10,000. But as soon as you reach 6,000, 7,000 patients, you know you're going to come across one very soon. So you have to be prepared. Uh, so in short, uh, Andreas, I mean, you know, very, very few side effects. Okay, so uh, this is what Bernard showed on his slide. It's uh, safe uh, even in the intensive care unit right okay so um uh, i think we have uh, maybe one last uh, question um what is really uh um what do you think about um, pericardial effusion? It is it is easier to recognize a pericardial effusion with contrast. Uh, Bernard, what do you think? No, it's not a particular indication, except maybe in mm -hmm. patients with pseudo aneurysm. I think it has been shown that it's really helpful in this particular setting, and uh, you miss much less uh, pseudo aneurysm using contrast uh, in this particular setting. Uh, compared to non-contrast echo. So I think this is the main indication, I, I think, for pericardial disease. Uh, but of course, uh, it, it's part of the rule out. I think if you use contrast and you can clearly show that the problem is something different, ischemic uh, or uh, related to a, a bad global function, of course, uh, you can somewhere also exclude that uh, there is a, a, a pericardial effusion. But uh, nevertheless, it would be also helpful to better identify the motion of the septum. For example, if you are any degree of suspicion of constrictive pericarditis, you can sometimes identify a septal bouncing that you should have missed uh, without contrast. So, but it's, uh, it's not the main indication for sure. Okay, thank you. I think uh, this was a very interesting discussion. Um, we are now approaching the end of the webinar and I would like to close this session by summarizing the key messages for your daily practice. Um, echocardiographic imaging in COVID-19 is indicated when it is likely to substantially change patient management. Contrast echocardiography is not routinely recommended in all COVID-19 patients, but it acutely ill patients, it has been shown to be safe and to save life. Uh, patient management can be 
improved by use of contrast echocardiography by more timely and accurate diagnosis and avoidance of downstream tests and myocardial contrast imaging that means low mechanical low mechanical index imaging can be used to distinguish uh, ischemia versus non ischemic left ventricular dysfunction but of course experience and training is needed Thank you to Professor Senior and to Professor Cousin for the presentations. This program is supported by Braco in form of an educational grant. You will be able to watch this webinar on demand on the ESC website. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>